So often I uh, start with a question that I don't necessarily anticipate that you're going to answer. This morning changes that. So I, I'm actually looking for an answer this morning. Are you ready? Do you believe this morning that God is here? Good answer. 100% so far, right? And do it. And maybe not all of you answered because some of you are going, I, I, I don't really know. It is indeed God really here? But for those of you who quickly and obediently answered yes, let me ask you this. How do you know he's here? Elaine's patting her heart. You with her? Right? Because if he's in our hearts and we are here, then he is here, right? What else? His promises, okay? In his word, which we'll get to today, right? Good. Thanks, Dick. The Bible tells us so. There you go, right? The Bible tells us that he is here. It says in Hezekiah 6.3, he'll show up at Covenant Church on February 5th. And, uh, and that's exactly what we trust this morning, right? You know there's not a book of Hezekiah. Okay, just, just clear. All right, so, so yeah, so, but the Bible does tell us, right, that, that he promises to be with us and here with us. So I, we're, we're going to jump to the deep end real quick, right? Two big church words, two big church words that help us understand that indeed God is here. First big church word is this, transcendence. Trans- Ooh, isn't, doesn't that sound good? Right? And it's that sense that God is everywhere. You see that all through the Bible, right? That in the heavens and in the earth, and the places even below the earth, right? The reality is, is that God is everywhere. Big church word, transcendence. And most of us get that, right? Here's the one that sometimes we struggle with. Imminence. Ooh, another big church word. It just simply means that God breaks through and is very real, tangible, alive in our worlds. Now, that's all through the Bible too, but sometimes for us it becomes harder to believe that God indeed breaks through to be very near to his people. I guess I would challenge us this morning to put a set of glasses on. If you wear glasses, you understand this. If not, you can pretend, right? to put a set of glasses on that begins to help you to see God here this morning. That like he's actually present in our hearts, in our midst, that he is transcendent in that he is everywhere, but that he is even imminent today in that he has drawn near. And where we'll work to this morning is to this very table because none of you said it, but you'll get it, right? That one of the visible ways in which that we can know that he is here is at this table, is at this table. Now, you're going, whoa, whoa, Pastor Rick, crazy theology. Is God actually present in these elements? Well, no, there's no miraculous thing that happens that makes this the blood of Christ and the body of Christ. But they're not simply signs or symbols either as good presbyterians we believe that he is spiritually present at this table in these elements that he has become imminent today as we come to the lord's table that that's the deep end right so so let me back up and let us get to that place this morning if, if you're just joining us, we've been in a series the last four weeks called Glory Days, if you like Springsteen, right? Uh, the, the, the reality is, is we've, we've headed into the Old Testament, um, and, and we are looking at the ways, quite frankly, in the ways that God has become imminent in showing up to his people. We're four weeks in, we have eight weeks to go, and, and if I'm being honest, uh, the, series has, the series has actually kind of morphed into something that I didn't expect or intend, and I won't ask you to enter into the complexity of my mind and how that all happens, right? Uh, but just know that it has subtly changed in my heart, and what you have to deal with is whatever is doing in my heart 
<laughs> it's coming to you on Sunday mornings, right? Uh, in that reality. And there's been this change. And, and, and really the change is, is that the focus has become the presence of God. That God is near. So turn to me with me this morning to First Kings. First Kings, chapter eight, verses one through eleven. First Kings, chapter eight, verses one through eleven. In, in January, we we took the month and we focused on the tabernacle, right? And if I was to summarize that section out of Exodus as we looked at the tabernacle, I would say how remarkable it is that God would take a broken, idol-worshiping people and still decide to reveal himself, to come near to them and ask them to be a part of it in building a, a movable tabernacle where his presence would dwell. And the application of that is, is that I believe it's equally amazing that, that God would take me or us, right, a broken idol-worshiping, distracted people and indeed promise that he draws near to us and draws near to us that we might together build his kingdom. That through our talents and our treasures, um, through the resources that we have and the abilities that we have, that he has asked us to be his church. This morning, I, I want to turn the pages of history forward 480 years. That's a long time. That's a big skip, all the way to the building of the temple. So we, we move from the tabernacle, this, this movable uh, sanctuary where the presence of God dwells, to the temple, which is a now more permanent home built under the leadership, ironically, of Solomon, the name of the works dog introduced to you this morning, um, where he has been building this temple for the past seven years. And where we turn today is the moment that God inhabits the temple. Much like last week, we looked at how he inhabited the tabernacle. And I would invite you to see three things in the text this morning, of course, three things in our ongoing series in glory days, and that is the story of God's presence for his people, the glory of God's presence for his people, and the hope of God's presence for his people. First Kings chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. This is the very word of God. Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the leaders of the fathers' houses of the people of Israel, before King Solomon in Jerusalem to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. And all the men of Israel assembled to King Solomon at the feast in the month of Ethanim, which is the seventh month, and all the elders of Israel came, and the priest took up the ark. And they brought up the ark of the Lord, the tent of meeting, and all the holy vessels that were in the tent. The priests and the Levites brought them up. And King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel who had assembled before him were with him before the ark, sacrificing so many sheep and oxen that they could not be counted or numbered. Then the priests brought the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to its place in the inner sanctuary of the house in the most holy place, underneath the wings of the cherubim. For the cherubim spread out their wings over the place of the Ark, so that the cherubim overshadowed the Ark and its poles. And the poles were so long that the ends of the poles were seen from the holy place before the inner sanctuary, but they could not be seen from outside. And they are there to this day. There was nothing in the ark except the two tablets of stone that Moses put there at Horeb, where the Lord made a covenant with the people of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. And when the priests came out of the holy place, a cloud filled the house of the Lord, so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. Uh, may God help us and the understanding of his word. I know you're good Presbyterians, but that story should astound us. It should amaze us. And so let's go into that story and unpack the story and see God's glory and together find hope today. 
So first this morning, the story of God's presence to his people. Uh, Verse one, uh, one of the things that has been a a constant through the amazing 480 year story between the tabernacle, right? And the temple is a really cool box. It, It was this box. Well, maybe not quite that box, but it is my favorite movie, right? Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Actually, they did a pretty good job, I think, on the Ark. This is a good point for Christ and culture right here, right? right? But, so, so come tonight, Christ and culture, six to eight, you understand. But th- this might be actually a better picture. We really don't know. But here is this grand box, in Exodus 25, 10 through 22, uh, God tells Moses to build a box out of acacia wood, a little less than, I don't know, four feet long. That's probably short of four feet. A little less than four feet long, uh, a little more than two feet wide, and a little more than two feet high. All right? And, and in the box it would be the Ten Commandments. And the box would be covered entirely of gold. And the poles that would go through it would be entirely made of gold and that mercy seat that sits on top of it would be two cherubim right with wings outstretched touching one another and the reality of this is this place of God's presence his imminence because as that box was placed in the tabernacle the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle and in this story right as that box is placed in the temple his glory fills the temple so in exodus 25 they're told to build it we can see then this box lead the people of god through the wilderness 40 years remember the clouds uh during the day and the fire at night it came from this box we would see it be the very cause of the parting of the jordan river Remember that story in Joshua 3? God's people coming to the Jordan River to go into the promised land and God would instruct the priests to carry the ark before the people and as they stepped into the Jordan River, the Jordan River would part. In Joshua 6, we see the box again going to the walls of Jericho as they marched around for seven days, uh, the city of Jericho. And on that last day, blew the trumpets and shouted. The ark was leading the way, leading the procession in all of that as the walls of Jericho came tumbling down. Maybe the most intuitive intriguing story of the Ark of Covenant, though, comes in 1 Samuel 4 and 6. God's people are losing a battle against the Philistines, right? And so they said, hey, we've kind of left the Ark behind. Maybe we should bring the Ark to the battle lines. And so they did. And you would think that they would then win, right? Wrong. They lost to the Philistines. That's another sermon for another day. But what happened is as they lost to the Philistines, the Philistines took the Ark captive. They said, hey, Pretty nice piece of box right there. Let's take that box. And, and, and they understood that it was God, right? That, that the power of their God would be in it. But they had no idea how the power of God would take a different shape and form in the Philistines' life. But they took that box. Remember the story? They took that box and they put it in their temple with their God, Dagon, right? And they said, oh, this must be a temple for God. So let's put their God in our God. But the next day when they came in, Dagon had fallen on his face. The statue of Dagon had fallen on his face before the Ark of the Covenant. And they're like, was it windy last night? Okay, who did this? Where's the Israelites? I'm somebody must have. So they, they set Dagon back up again and said, it must have been some kind of freak thing. They come in the next day, and Dagon is not only on his face, but broken in pieces before the Ark of the Covenant. This is the power of this box. And they're going, Whoa, kind of freaked them out. And then you have this whole hot potato thing with the Ark of the Covenant. You ever play hot potatoes? You try to get rid of the thing as fast as you can? Well, that's kind of the way the Ark did. The Ark would go someplace, and people break out in boils and go someplace else, and there's these huge rats that would come. And there's like, whoa, this thing is like dangerous. And so hot potato, they're passing it from city to city. And finally, they come to their senses and go, maybe we should give this thing back. And so this really creative way, which we won't get into this morning, they send it back to Israel, right? And Israel takes that box. And then the box kind of goes into obscurity for a while. But 20 years later, there's this king. His name is King David. And he goes, this box is something special. We need to bring this box to Jerusalem. Remember this story? And so they, they, they load up the box on a cart. I don't know what they did with the poles. They should have kept the poles. The poles were really important. But they didn't have the poles. They thought it would be better to put it on a cart. They put it on a cart. They're moving the cart towards Jerusalem. Everybody's celebrating. It's a really good time. 
I think you've seen me do this dance before, but the reality is, is they're having a grand time bringing it, but the cart slips. Therefore, the ark slips, and a guy by the name of Uzza, poor Uzza, reaches out to settle the ark on the cart, and then he dies. You've never heard that story. That's a sermon for another time. Ask Pastor Matthew. He'll explain it to you. The reality is, though, is what you need to understand is that this box is not just some superstitious box. It's not some grand golden ornament. It is still, listen, the presence of God. And I think Uzzah's death was even a reminder to the people of God that this was his presence. And in 8.1, we now see the progression of leadership from David to Solomon. And Solomon has wisely brought this ark from Zion, the city of Jerusalem, not far out of Jerusalem, to where he had built this temple. And we have this glorious procession of this great ark, the presence of God. That's the story as we catch up to this place, but don't miss in the text itself the glory of God's presence to his people. Three things really fast about the glory of God's presence to his people. First, a glory that caused all to come. Uh, Look at verse two, but it's all through the text. It says, all the men of Israel assembled to King Solomon at the Feast of Ethanim, which is the seventh month. And later in verse three, it says, all the elders came. And then later it's all the people. And you see all the all. And guess what all is in Hebrew? All, you've got it. And so it means that everyone is here. I, can, can I tell you something that the, the readers would have known without being told, but we probably wouldn't know without doing some study? The festival that is happening at this point is the Festival of Booths. It was a joyous occasion that the people of God would recreate the booths that they'd lived in during the wilderness journey and celebrate the faithfulness of God. It was a great occurrence, but it also meant that many of the Israelites would have been in pilgrimage to Jerusalem in celebration as well. An amazing time of celebration. And and listen, the person or the family that did not come was the exception more than the rule. And in our text here, the word that is used to describe the momentum of the many that would come is that they all came. Now, it'd be really easy to apply this as the pastor. You all should come to church, right? You all should get your priorities, right? But I'd be preaching to the choir this morning in some respects because you are here. All of you are here here, right? But it would be easy to see this application of, man, we all need to be in worship all the time. You need to all come to church. But listen, it would be a bad application. Because listen, I, I don't see Solomon grandstanding on some pulpit telling his people all to come. The only thing that's happening is it's a report that they all were there. Can you see in that a people who are hungry, a people who are desperate, a people who are thirsty, not, listen, not wanting to miss out on the glory of God, the presence of God, of being a part of a movement of celebration that they wouldn't even be able to imagine as it played out in front of them. Nobody had to grandstand and tell them that they needed to come to church. The reality is is that being in church in the presence of God in this box as it's placed in the temple was the place that everyone should be. And I think that we're missing that often in the church today. Believing that in coming to church we, that we would experience God that in coming to church, we might believe and expect that we might see and know and walk in the presence of God, the nearness of God, the power of God, the miracles of God. Let's be honest. 
If we really thought that was God was going to reveal himself at 1030 in Covenant Church on every Sunday morning, would there be anything, would there be anything that could distract you from being here? I would hope not. But I think we've missed that. But we, we began this morning by all acknowledging that God is here. But do we really believe, anticipate, and expect that that is true? If we did so, it wouldn't be the power of the preacher, the wonderful praise team, the amazing choir, the great music, the wonderful leaders. It would, it would not be any of that that draws us to this place, but the power and the presence of God. In this moment, 1 Kings 8, the glory of God caused them all to come. Uh, secondly, the glory of God brought confession of sin. Look at verse 5. King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel, get that, all the congregation of Israel, who had assembled before him, were with him before the ark, sacrificing so many sheep and oxen that they could not be counted or numbered. First of all, that's gross. Can we just say that out loud? That, that, that's kind of gross, right? I mean, imagine just for a second, sorry you animal rights activist folks, but if we started a parade on the top of the West Hill, right? all the way to Covenant Church, so down the hill, up the hill, and along the way, we were sacrificing so many sheep and oxen that you couldn't number them? That image? That's gross. It's a lot of blood. It's a lot of carcasses. It's pretty foul odor. Don't do that right before water fire. People aren't going to come, right? And, and, and in some ways, it's a verse that we just want to run past because to stop and think of all the blood, the carcasses, and the smell, the sights just make you a little sick. Lunch all of a sudden doesn't sound so good. What is up with that? Oh, oh don't, don't miss what is up with that. Why? Why did the people of Israel make sacrifices of sheep and oxen? They're both sacrifices for sin. For sin. So peer through the grossness, right, and see the beauty of confession in that moment. And in that confession, see the people's need for God and his forgiveness. And see in that the bigness, the holiness, the purity, and the glory of God. Solomon, in, right after this text, had an amazing prayer of dedication in this chapter. And the theme of that prayer is that God would hear their prayer and forgive their sin. Fourteen times in the prayer, Solomon mentions that the Lord hear them. And five of those fourteen were that their sins would be forgiven. What was on their minds? What was on their minds is that they had forgotten about the presence of God. They had forgotten about the power of God. And as God was now manifesting, becoming imminent, near, glorying before them, their sins were apparent, so much so they couldn't sacrifice enough sheep and oxen. Listen, what was gross was the darkness of their hearts. And the only way they know to get to purity was these sacrifices to a big and holy and glorious God. So the glory of God brought confession of sin. It's why people of covenant that we make confession a weekly part of our ceremony. Aren't you glad we don't have to sacrifice sheep and oxen? But we have this sacrifice, the sacrifice once and for all of Christ. But in the simplicity of this table, don't miss, first of all, the grossness of your sin and the complexity of God's love to us. 
that make God big, pure, that bring God glory. Hmm. Thirdly, this glory reminds the people of their place. Uh, verses 6 and 7 says, Then the priest brought the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to its place in the inner sanctuary of the house in the most holy place, underneath the wings of the cherubim. For the cherubim spread out their wings over the place of the Ark, so that the cherubim overshadowed the Ark and its poles. We've got to ask ourselves, why in this short text is the cherubim mentioned three times? <laughs> it's, it's a big deal. Real quick, let me pull back your memories what did god place at the edge of the garden of eden when adam and eve were cast out due to their sin anybody remember yeah it was cherubim with flaming sword that would prevent the people from entering again into the garden of eden and what still stands in our way back to the garden that we dream about at the return of christ believe it or not in the heavenlies it is still cherubim with flaming sword so get the significance of the cherubim built into the mercy seat of the ark, here seemingly larger than life, and placed on the ark of the covenant. Two things, it's a reminder of our distance from a holy God. We are still not where we desire to be in his presence, in perfection. But also see it as an invitation to see in part what we have yet to see as a whole. And in both, we see the glory of God. He is still set apart. He is still holy. We are still not in a place of perfection. He is holy. We are not. But it is his intention to make us holy. It is his invitation to righteousness. It is the gateway to his presence. And see how God is making his imminence known. Then in a very real way in verses 10 and 11. As that ark is set into place it says when the priest came out of the holy place a cloud filled the house of the lord so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud for the glory of the lord filled the house of the lord here it is again we saw it last week both terrifying driving the priest to a place of humility and yet exhilarating to know that god god is that near the, the cloud that held his voice the cloud that held his power the cloud that held his authority his presence has come into the temple he is no less big no less glorious in coming to his people and so we find great hope that our god is near ah i hope you sense the mixed emotion of this event that you see the glory of god and actually feel some terror but also see the desire of a God to be near his people and this morning find great hope. God is here this morning. I, I know that. I, I don't know where you all are, <laughs> where the struggle is, what it is that you're walking through. But I am certain that God is here in a transcendent way, in a way that he is everywhere, but in an imminent way in that he desires to break through in your life and mine to reveal his glory. It, it's been said that we cannot attain the presence of God. We're, we're already totally in the presence of God. What's missing is awareness. Are we aware of the presence of God? As we come to this table, I want you to put your I want to see God glasses on. What do you see? As I, as I hold the elements, as I take the bread and the juice, and we put our God glasses on, what is it that we see? We see Christ crucified for us, his people. We see a sacrifice made for the forgiveness of our sins. We see eternity 
for us because of the work of Christ. I, as you put your God glass, I want to see God glasses on. Today, this element, this supper brings glorious hope of eternity, of forgiveness, of cleansing, of his love for us. But I also want you to see something else. I, I want you to put your God glasses on and see his power. This God is the God who parted the Red Sea, who, who parted the Jordan River. This is the God who spoke to Israel from the mountain, a mountain that would shake. It is this Jesus who walked amidst his people. It is this Jesus who healed people who were lame and blind and deaf. It is this Jesus who rose people from the dead. And I would suggest to you this morning that yes, indeed, it is this Jesus who has died for your sins, that has given you the hope of eternity. But I would also say as we take this supper today that this is the Jesus who wants to meet you, who wants to be present with you in the very struggle that you are walking through today. This is the Jesus who wants to heal you today, who wants to grant you peace, who wants to grant you comfort, who wants to grant you in his presence hope for you in your life right now. Can I tell you a quick story? Uh, many of you have heard me reference my daughter and her struggle in infertility. And I've openly shared about that because when my granddaughters are here who are now adopted and they're siblings and it's beautiful and it's been beautiful redemption to the infertility that Megan has walked through, right? Years and years and years of trying to have children but can't, but here comes adoption and there's these two kids that run all over the sanctuary when they're here and they're glorious and we love Grace and Charlie, we see God's redemption, but there is still, what? Every day the struggle of infertility. Well, I'm allowed to tell you now because it's Facebook official. My daughter is pregnant. <laughs> it took her two months to believe that she was actually pregnant. <laughs> and when she told us, we kind of went, what are you telling us? You know, it, it's just, it, it had been so commonplace, right? But it shook me because, you know what, if I'm really honest, I had given up on the presence of Jesus to do a miracle in her life. <laughs> so, oh, we see your answer, Jesus, it's these two cute little girls. And he's going, oh, no, I've got something better. Can you hear that this morning? For where you are, the presence of of God here now for you. That's this.